Today on Cedar Fort Media and Publishing Behind the Scenes, we have Julie Major, author of The Secret of Haversham House and British War Children. Hi, Julie. Welcome. Hi. Thanks for having me. I'm excited to speak with a fellow romance author today. I also write some period romance, but not Regency. So what led you to write a Regency romance? That is actually an interesting story. Um, I lived in the same neighborhood as Brandon Mull. Really? And um, his wife was in my book club, and she had been asked to write a little blurb about one of the first Regency books that came out and mentioned that the publishing house was hungry for that kind of book. And I had considered writing, and I thought, could I do that? I was writing children's historical fiction at the time, and so I took it on as a challenge. I do love Jane Austen, the pure Jane Austen, and I just thought, let's give it a go. That's awesome. And that's awesome that you live by Brandon Mould. Do you still know him? Yes. <laughs> that's awesome. I love his books. Okay, so what? tell us what your first two books are about then. That kind of um, is part of your story here. Yes. Um, when I first decided to try writing, I... The question that came to me was about my grandmother and what would have happened if a bomb that hit their street had landed a few feet closer to her house. And the result would be that I wouldn't be here. And that does something to a person when you consider that possibly your life might not have happened or would have been very different. My grandmother had grown up on a Victorian street with the the row houses all the way down the street. And across from her was a small block of apartments. And when I was 14, I became like conscious that it was there and I asked her and she told me, well, that's where the bomb landed. And normally the air raid sirens would go off and for some reason they hadn't. And so no one was in the bomb shelters. My grandmother was upstairs, obviously heard heard it and ran to the top of the stairs and the stairs were gone and the house across the street was obliterated and so they just never rebuilt that house they just rebuilt it as this apartment oh i see i see so it was just different yeah okay so i thought about that real life event that had happened to my grandmother who was pregnant with my father at the time and decided to use that as the genesis for the book I changed it a bit and put the bomb landing next to a school. So the school is really damaged and my main characters are hurt, but they're not killed. And that event makes their mother reconsider evacuation. Evacuation started, I think, in 1939. And a lot of children did go away to the countryside because they felt that it would be safer. In some respects it worked, in others it didn't. The children eventually came back. But this event causes this mother in my book to decide, I'm done, I can't, I can't handle this kind of stress. Mm-hmm. So I knew that it could happen that a bomb would land without warning. You know, the, the safety measures are not perfect and it had happened to my grandmother. Anyway, so these children are sent to the country where their sis- uh, the mother's sister lives and the war follows them there. So they have adventures while they're in the coast that have to do with the war. It sounds really interesting to me. And you also have a very interesting family history as well, having had your grandparents go through the war. So tell me, um, going back to The Secret of Habersham House, how did you research for this book? Hmm. <laughs> well, I think my whole life was kind of a research for it. I, like I said, I loved her books. Um, I loved the period dramas that they made from the books. And obviously I'm English, so um, that has a bearing on it. So I feel like more that my life and the way I was conducting it was the preparation for it. Whereas the World War II books, I really had to research that because... I hadn't been a history major or anything, and I just needed to find things out. Whereas with the Regency, I mean, obviously I had traveled because in the book, the main character travels. In fact, when she goes to France, I lived there. And so that was something I could describe 
from my memory. In fact, I remember when <laughs> I sent it to beta readers, they said, you know, that bit in France in the Chateau, that's too long because I was pouring my memories into it. Then when it came to see the fort and the editor looked at it, she goes, that bit in France, that's too long. But I, I had been there that I was describing a view that I had seen myself. So I reluctantly cut some of that out. But that, that was really the research that I did, reading Jane Austen, going to classes um, about that period and just traveling in that area. So can you give us, uh, well, it's up to you, if you want to give us a spoiler-free or not um, summary of what The Secret of Haversham House is about. Well, it started with a question for me. Um, class is still very much alive in England, obviously not the way it was in the Regency period. And so much of how your life was going to play out would depend on in which circumstances you were born. So it led me to the question, what if you were this fetid girl who everyone loved because of your background and your family, how would their attitude towards you change if it turned out that that really wasn't your pedigree? So that was the beginning of how I started the book. So there's this girl, she has no idea that she is adopted because the circumstances surrounding her adoption are unusual and her parents decide that it's in everyone's best interests not to mention it because of this problem of class. And um, so they keep it a secret, thinking that it will never come to light. And of course, inevitably it does. So the secret of her birth comes to light because her birth mother dies and on her deathbed, she confesses to her father that she had a baby because she hadn't been able to have any children with her husband. So she was leaving no posterity. And she wanted her father to know that there was a child out there. So he starts a quest to find this child while she's just living her life um, as a debutante. She has a coming out ball. She meets a guy uh, who's a bit of a bad lot. But he's important because she is so naive at the beginning. She's been very sheltered. She's this only precious child. Um, and him coming into the picture helps her grow up a little bit. Then this hidden secret comes to light and everything is turned upside down. Her grandparents even are a little... They just don't know what to do with the emotions that this brings up because of how important class is at that period of time. So it's about her journey after that. She decides that she wants to meet her birth family, which takes her to Italy um, by way of France, because that's where she was ad adopted from. And how, you know, her own feelings about meeting this family and considering how people are thinking of her back home and what she does with all that information. So how did you come up with the plot of this book? It really was just thinking about class. I went to a university in England that had a lot of children of peers, which is a social class in England where your parents are knighted or, you know, sir or lady. Um, a lot of them would attend the college and obviously I wasn't one of those and there was this kind of divide between us and there was even a, a, a nickname for them they were called the wellies which wouldn't mean anything to anyone here but you in England we wear Wellington boots a lot because it rains a lot and it's muddy and they particularly would because they would usually live on these grand houses on big estates and they would have horses and so the nickname for them was wellies and I guess that's just stayed in my mind that, you know, there was this kind of divide between us. Mm -hmm. I was this little girl from London with a slightly Cockney accent back in those days. And, you know, we just didn't mix. Mm -hmm. So that was really the, the beginning of the idea for the book and how it would affect people. Also, I had had experiences in my life where I had reacted very differently to the way that I thought I would react. 
And that was something I wanted to put in the book too. So, so it was all very personal yes, to you. Yeah, those experiences were personal to me. Yeah. If you had asked me ahead of time about experience X, I would have told you I will react this way. And when that actually happened, I reacted very differently. So that's why I put the part about Philip being surprised at, at those feelings of prejudice that come to him when he does learn mm -hmm. that this girl, Francesca, is actually the daughter of a stable boy. And I think that that does happen in life. We think we're just so open-minded and then things will happen maybe in our own family and suddenly we're not so open-minded. Obviously, you're from the UK. <laughs> yep. <laughs> and birth circumstances still matter there quite a bit. Um, I'm not sure that it's as much that it matters, in, but that it puts you in a box. Okay. Now, disclaimer, I haven't actually lived there for 30 years. I visit frequently. So things have changed. Mm -hmm. But on the whole, if I meet someone for the first time, by the time they've spoken one sentence, I have been able to categorize them from their accent. Mm -hmm. That is something that has always fascinated me about the UK, as it is such a tiny region of the world, and there are so many varieties of accent there. There are. <laughs> I've always found that so interesting, how you can almost, you know, peg someone down to the street they live on by what their accent is. Yes, My Fair Lady is a little bit of an exaggeration, but it's not that much. I mean, I'm from South London, and the accent on the east and the north and the west is slightly different. I did, in England, you have to interview for a college place. And one of the colleges I was interested in getting into was very far north near Scotland, but not Scotland. So it was definitely not Scottish accents. And I got off the train, got on the bus and asked the bus driver to tell me the right bus stop to get off at. And to this day, I have no idea what he said to me. And I remember <laughs> thinking, he's speaking English, I'm speaking English, and I cannot understand you. And I was so embarrassed, I didn't ask him to repeat it. <laughs> <laughs> you just, just figured it out on your own, huh? <laughs> figured it out on my own, yeah. So how long have you lived in America? Um, I was just thinking it's been 31 years. Okay. So what what are the differences in terms of prejudices between America and the UK? Have you noticed any? Well, I think one of the things that impressed me when I first came to America that was it didn't really matter where you were born because you all had these opportunities and it was more about where you were going and what you could achieve. In England, like I said, you can categorize someone but I think we've moved on that we don't keep that category for a person. You know, they can work their way up. I mean, I was accepted by people that were definitely from a different class than me when I was at college. They, It wasn't like they said, oh, well, she's this little girl from South London. We're not going to associate with her. And that's not what I meant. Mm -hmm. It does embrace. It's just that the people from high society just have totally different experiences and I think that that was more what kept us apart. Um, you know, obviously with Prince Harry marrying Meghan, that's, you know, just crushed some walls that may be set up because she's not English, she's not from the peerage. And so I'm interested to see how that like trickles down mm -hmm. to the regular person. But yeah, I, it's not like you wouldn't get a job because you didn't speak properly. I don't think that that would still be mm -hmm. the case. Interesting. So let's move on to some questions from our review crew members. What is your favorite scene, chapter, or moment from the book? Hmm. Um, I, I love Augusta. So she, I'm a pantser writer, which means that I don't plan every last detail of my book. I know the beginning, I know kind of the end, but the rest is a little bit of a mystery. So it's does, really exciting to write. Does that come from writing by the seat of your pants? Yes. <laughs> is that what that's Yes. Wrong? Okay. It's writing by the seat of your pants. Exactly. And 
So my characters develop and sometimes a character will come in that I haven't expected. I, it, that sounds bizarre and I don't really know how to explain that. But it, it's not bizarre to me. Okay. <laughs> I get so it. The but. story <laughs> flows sometimes right. out of my fingers. And I remember um, worrying about Augusta because she's just so mean, right? And I thought, she's just too mean to be real. And I'm a member of a closed Facebook group. I'm not going to say which one, but it's a safe place for people to express how they're really feeling. And on that group, people share about their mothers-in-law. And there were mothers-in-law reported in that Facebook group who were much worse than Augusta. Yeah. And that made me feel better because my experience hasn't been that. I have great parents, but she's so mean that was outside my experience. And so to see that there are real people like that was a good validation that mm -hmm. she was a, a, a realistic character. So I, I just love the scenes with her. She's so haughty. She's sort of scratched her way to the top and she's just willing to step on anyone at all costs to maintain her queen-like mm -hmm. status. Um, so just the scenes with her are just interesting because they had come out of nowhere. I just, I love where she goes to France to escape that the fact that her husband has mismanaged all their money and that they're now pretty much destitute and the way she talks back to the letter that her son writes her you know mm -hmm. you've got to come back and I just yeah she's just someone that is not in my circle of actual friends certainly she wouldn't be a friend because she's not very nice but it was just she so wasn't really anybody's real friend she wasn't anybody's <laughs> not real even friend. her husband's in the end that's right <laughs> so would you say that she's your true villain in the story yes Yes, definitely. Yes, yeah, she is quite the character, but I, I have, I don't know anybody like that personally, but I have heard horror stories as well about um, people that behave that way. <laughs> so that's interesting to me how that became like your favorite part of the book. I think because I could write it and not have to live it. You know, yeah, we're trying to live this good life. And you kind of wonder what it would be like to be mm -hmm. mean to everyone. And writing gives you an outlet to right. do that without hurting anyone's it's a, feelings. It's an exploration. It is. I have characters like that as well that um, are kind of like, they do everything that I would never do. You know, they do it. <laughs> and it's fun. It's fun to kind of put yourself in that place and kind of try to figure out why would they do this and what's their background and that sort of thing. It is fun. What, oh, this one's deep. <laughs> I hope I asked you this one before. What are some of the circumstances in your life that helped you to learn to see past the face of a person to their soul? Well, growing up in London, it was, even when I was young, it was very multicultural. So that just really wasn't a problem for me ever. I, ha I grew up amongst Indians from India people from the West Indies and Africa. So I'm not sure that I personally ever had that issue that the way a person looked or spoke or their skin color was ever a problem because I had grown up in such a, a cosmopolitan area. So I don't know that I can answer that because I didn't really, that wasn't a life experience mm -hmm. I had, but I watched it obviously with other people. Mm -hmm. You never had to come to a place where that was a lesson you had to learn. No, but my life's not over yet, so maybe yeah. I will. <laughs> <laughs> okay. This will be kind of fun for us to talk about since I'm also an author. How would the book change for better or for worse if the reader wasn't made aware of the secret of Francesca's adoption in the beginning? What if you are writing a totally different book? <laughs> right. So when I write, I print everything off in a hard copy for multiple reasons, not least of which is I make technology freak out, <laughs> as we've had experience with trying to do this podcast. Um, and I print it out and I put a tab on the side. 
and it will say chapter one or whatever. So that when I finish the book, if I want to, I can move the chapters around. And I moved that first chapter or prologue multiple times mm -hmm. around. Um, I wasn't sure if to put it at the beginning or if to leave it to the middle as someone's recollection after this secret comes about. And I asked various people, where do you think I should put this? Because it, it didn't have to be at the beginning, right? Right. And even though the title is The Secret of Havisham House, it clearly isn't a mystery. Right. And so I did play with putting it in different places. And I think it was my editor in the end that said, let's keep it at the beginning. Mm -hmm. So I did consider that. Um, I had been to a class about secrets, an, a writing class, and the the teacher of the class said that it's really good to have secrets, either secrets from your character or secrets from your readers because it makes them want to read more to find out the secret. So yeah, I did put the secret at the beginning, but then the author knows something that the character doesn't know. And I felt like there would be a tension that would be good for the reader because as Francesca has different experiences, the reader should be going in their head, but no, mm -hmm. if you only knew. So I think that that experience for the reader would have been lost. One of my one star reviews was from a middle-aged man, which I might point out is not my target audience. Why were you reading her book? <laughs> uh, and, Why do they even bother? <laughs> and he said, why did you give the mystery away at the beginning? Um, and so obviously that could be an issue for people. Mm -hmm. But I did. I wanted the reader to know something that the character didn't. And and for the whole first half of the book, that's the experience of the mm -hmm. reader. It would be different if I had done it the other way. I, I don't know that it would have made the story different because I think you as a reader would have had suspicions because obviously, Giorgio, the birth grandfather, is also right at the beginning of the book. So, you know, an intelligent mm -hmm. writer would have put that together anyway. And like I said, it's not a mystery. Right. Yeah, and I, I think that's the major point. Um, maybe I'll go on there and, and write a rebuttal to his review. <laughs> <laughs> that, you know, it, it wasn't a mystery novel. Yes. And that's exactly what it would have changed it to if you would have left. That's like the flashback at the beginning of Francesca's story. Right. That she doesn't know about. So it's her mystery, but it's not a mystery novel. And that definitely would have been a very different book. Yes. Rather than, and I feel like the way you wrote it, because I know you love Jane Austen, was much more along the lines of how she would have written something because she didn't do mystery either right and so it, it the flow was more Jane Austen-esque than you know some mystery novel so good for you and I will try to get a hold of that person and <laughs> you and my husband both <laughs> others need to stick together <laughs> explain to people sometimes <laughs> okay would, she says, would it add a sense of intrigue? Yes, it, it would turn it into a mystery novel. Um, okay, how does Francesca transition from a naive girl to more centered and aware? As an author, how did you portray that? Well, first of all, I think we have to give Francesca a little bit of the benefit of the doubt. She was a special child because her parents couldn't have children, so they doted on her protected her. She was privileged. I mean, how much experience is a girl like that going to have by mm -hmm. the time she's 18? I don't think we can judge her by 21st century standards. So obviously she's going to be self-centered somewhat. Um, everyone has always done everything she's wanted. So yeah, as an author, you have to create circumstances that will not rip the naivety away, but that are 
a trial enough that that character has to have a sort of Mm self-awakening some growth some growth yeah Mm -hmm. so that's why langley comes into the picture um she's completely bowled over by his good looks um she's excited because this is the first kind of romantic interaction she's had she's just 18 And so he just needed to mess with her um, and give her a a priority list of what was important in a romantic partner. Obviously, his looks were the the main thing that had attracted her. And when I was young, I think that that was probably my main thing was, Mm -hmm. you know, are they attractive? And so that he ended up being someone who was actually not just not very nice, but was actually dangerous and could have derailed her whole life for a completely different set of reasons was important to me because was she going to experience, you know, a kind of prejudice meeting this father who was essentially a servant? And I don't know that we can appreciate, because I don't have servants, that gap between the the people who employed the servants and the servants i think that's probably something we can't really understand and so having had that experience with langley i think just made her heart more of a an open book you know where she was ready for new adventures and and ready to do things that were maybe unexpected Mm -hmm. i i put the uh, another one of my favorite scenes is when they're in France and they meet the the reverend and his name is um, Septimus Sladen and that is a real name I'm a genealogist as well and I found that name in my genealogical research I'm like I just have to put that name in the book (laughs) it's just too delicious and it just sounded like a vicar to me so anyway so she meets him And she has all kinds of preconceptions about him and about this wife that's married him. And I, and I, so I use that also as she finds out how much his wife loves him. She thinks he's ridiculous, but his wife is so grateful that he has married her. She's his second wife. He's brought her out of, you know, a single spinster kind of life. And I, and I used Francesca's mother to point out to Francesca look she's her life is a lot better than it was before she married him so experiences like that I wanted to give depth to Francesca's teenage mentality then obviously meeting her true family or her birth family um her grandfather is on the same social level as she is but certainly her father isn't so she was more prepared had she not had that experience with langley i'm not sure that that first meeting would have played out the way that it Mm -hmm. did so and of course all of it sets her up to be ready to accept philip as her soulmate Mm -hmm. because was he as good looking as langley no but his other qualities just outshined langley in every respect and she's got to a place where she sees that that is the most important thing in a partner. How much of, um, no, that's not the way to put it. So in the Regency era, they were very, very strict with women. You put a lot of that into your book about how just being seen with a man in an awkward place, even if nothing happens, can ruin you, can ruin you. So... How much of that that you put in your book is reality at that time? Is is that really close to how it was or is that it embellished a little bit? I am not an expert in the history of that time, so let's put that out there. But I would say that it was pretty accurate. Um, there was so much on the line, right? So many fortunes. Uh, if you did something that ruined your character – then that would eliminate you from a pool of potentially wealthy husbands. So maybe I've embellished it a bit. Um, I know that there is a school of thought that feels that there was a 
an undercurrent of culture that didn't keep to those strict rules. I haven't mm-hmm. researched that, but in looking at um, Facebook groups of other writers for that period, some of them feel that there was this undercurrent where there was immorality rampantly going on. I can't marry those two together because I just really read Jane Austen. Right. Um, And certainly in her books, that is not the case. So unless I decide to study that period, I don't know that I can give a definitive answer Mm -hmm. on whether I embellished it or not. Um, Did it have to do with class? Was it less prevalent with the lower classes to worry so much about those things? Even in my mother's time in the 50s, people were very careful not to be seen in the wrong places. Her father was particularly strict about those kinds of things. So from my own experience, I would say that that was important. Obviously, today, anything goes. Mm -hmm. So I think it's interesting to look back and see how strictly... Um, they did kind of obey those social rules. There's a professor at BYU uh, that teaches on Jane Austen every education week, and I go every year to her lectures, and she talks about how important it was that they keep these rules. Mm -hmm. Otherwise, the pattern of their life would just be ruined because they would not be eligible Mm -hmm. they would disqualify themselves and the rules were largely just for women it seems i mean there were rules for men but it seems like they were allowed to break them yes and it had no effect i would totally agree with that i didn't want to have my characters like that because i'm principally probably writing to an lds audience Mm -hmm. so obviously i wanted to keep my characters all pretty moral even though langley isn't it's suggested that he does these other things but no I think it's particularly interesting for Latter-day Saints to look back and think oh there was another time when people really cared about morality Mm -hmm. and I think that's why um, a lot of Christians uh, aside from Latter-day Saints really like the Regency novels is because you are almost guaranteed a clean read. Yes. <laughs> if it's a Regency novel. Right. Not, I've, I've seen some actually that aren't. Um, but for the most part, if it's a Regency novel, you're going to get a really squeaky, squeaky clean book. Like, if you are trying to be faithful to Jane Austen's right. style, absolutely. Yeah. And I've noticed that there is like a cult following of Regency writers, probably for that very reason, that I find very interesting. Um, So what are the takeaways that you wish readers um, to walk away with after finishing your novel? Um, I think one of them is you don't know the path that your life is going to take. You can have ideas about the direction it will take. But on the whole, that's not how life is supposed to be. It's not supposed to be a smooth, straight road. It's supposed to be very bumpy with lots of curves, which is what happens to my main character. And going back to this, are we as open-minded as we think we are? Mm -hmm. I think we just aren't as open-minded as we think we are. And until life throws at us situations that we haven't considered before, we really don't know. And I think that's a kind of exciting thing about us as humans. We think we know ourselves so well. And then things can happen that surprise us. I had had an experience... Uh, in the middle of my child rearing where we had a baby who was stillborn and I reacted so differently to the way that I thought I would react. It totally derailed me, not from my faith, but from my life. Mm -hmm. And it changed me. From there on out, whenever I heard that someone else had had a similar experience, my level of empathy was completely different and so I think that that's what I was exploring in the book Philip you know realizes oh I I do have some prejudices and works to overcome them he calls upon the powers of God to help him because he knows it's outside himself and it changes him forever so from then on especially given that 
Francesca's true father is not of their class, he would have had a much better relationship with him, knowing that he had faced his own prejudice and worked through it. So that's, I think, what I wanted people to think about when they read it, if they thought that seriously about the topics or if they were just escaping, that would be different. But yeah. And why, why did you have him admit to Francesca that he had those prejudices? When I was reading that, I was like, no, <laughs> don't tell her. You're ruining everything. Well, of course it, it didn't. But that's what I was thinking. Because from the beginning, he was the good guy, right? He was the open book. He's the good guy. He's very honest. So I couldn't have him not tell her. He couldn't mm-hmm. keep a secret from this girl that he loved. Um, and so that's why I had him tell her. And I think it would make her love him more mm-hmm. because she knew that he had had a problem with it and he would work through it. That would have made me love the man more. Mm-hmm. So that's why I put it in. And give her the, the confidence later, perhaps, that... Um, it wouldn't be an issue yes later on as well interesting how confident are you as a writer i believe that every author except maybe the big authors like jk rowling and others feel like imposters at some point i i can attest to that <laughs> i read an article by a psychologist about a thing called the imposter syndrome, and it resonated with me. Um, Until you have validation Mm -hmm. from outside sources that you can write, and even after sometimes, I think we're always second-guessing our abilities. Um, I sent my very first novel that I wrote, which was the British War Children about the children experiencing the war, to a competition for books by the League of Utah Writers. I wasn't really expecting very much. I don't really know what I hope to gain from it. I just put it in an envelope and sent it. And at the same time, I sent a book to the Deseret News. I didn't even know the protocol. I just was so green at this. And I won a recommended read from the League of Utah Writers And I can't tell you how that has boosted my confidence. They obviously had criticisms, but all the criticisms were not to do with the writing. They were about the cover, which we were brand new at this. We were trying to do it ourselves. And yeah, it wasn't a great cover. And so it was interesting to me that because that was their criticisms, it boosted my confidence that I could write. Then at the same time, my book landed on the desk of one of the reviewers for the Deseret News at just the right time. So I do think that luck plays a very huge role in success. And she needed some books about the war because it was approaching Memorial Day and she wanted to review some books. I I was a nobody. Mm -hmm. And it landed on her desk. She read it, she gave it to her daughter. Her daughter couldn't put it down. She didn't even want to eat. That boosted my confidence so much. So I keep that in the back of my mind. I also had a spiritual experience where I was second guessing because writing takes a lot of time, as you know. Mm -hmm. And I kept thinking, shouldn't I be doing something else with my time? And on one particular ride through that self-doubt, I was in the temple and a scripture I had opened a scripture in the celestial room and it was section 25 of the Doctrine and Covenants and he's talking to Emma Smith about collecting hymns. Well, that wasn't the bit that struck me. There's, there's a verse that says, you shall spend your time in writing and learning much. And it hit me right between the eyes and I went home and I printed it up and I have printed it and it sits above my computer so that when I doubt, I look at that and think, okay, he's my champion. And then I remember that I got that award and that this lady wrote a review for my book. I still need constant validation. And I'm assuming that that is the experience of all writers. Another thing I would tell myself is that Jane Austen didn't have huge success while she was alive. 
does that mean she wasn't a good writer before she was validated by becoming popular? No. She wrote the books before that. Mm -hmm. That didn't define whether she was a good writer. Um, J.K. Rowling was rejected many times. Did that mean that Harry Potter wasn't good? No. It just meant that she hadn't found the right outlet or the right person to appreciate her writing. So I do tell myself that that they were good writers before anyone recognized that. Mm -hmm. And so that that's the beginning of my journey. Obviously, I would go to, I joined um, my local writing group, which has since collapsed, but it was so valuable at the time. It helped me with the mechanics of writing. Then I started going to story makers. My friend dragged me to the very first one because I just didn't feel like I belonged. Mm -hmm. I just didn't feel like I was a real writer. And I just loved it. I mean, I ate it up, I took notes. So the second year I decided to pitch The Secret of Havisham House. I've never been as terrified in my whole life about anything as I was about that. I gave myself a migraine. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it, it was it was learning my craft, learning how this industry works. Since then, I've listened um, to podcasts about self-publishing and that kind of thing. So I, I feel like I'm more confident about the whole aspect of it. I went from being just a nobody who knew nothing, and now I'm not really a somebody, but I'm making it. Mm -hmm. I'm, I'm getting there. And I'm willing to learn from others that know more than me. And I do think that that's important. One of the things that has surprised me about writing is it really takes your pride and knocks it around. Yeah. <laughs> because you can get five five-star reviews, but that one-star review, that's the one it, that's going to bug you. It eats at you, yeah. And I have read, you know, not to read them, and my husband is actually the one that reads them. Um, so that I, because it would upset me probably mm -hmm. and make me go back to this self-doubt of, oh my goodness, I can't write. Um, it's a constant struggle. Mm-hmm. I think writing is something that I wish readers understood is that writing is so personal. Um, and, you know, you, you pour your heart and your soul and tears into writing a book. And I don't think I expected everyone, I definitely did not expect everyone to love my book. And I, I kind of had hoped that people who, like you were saying about that middle-aged <laughs> man who read your book which is the weirdest thing ever. He didn't ever. actually finish it. Oh gosh. <laughs> Rude. <laughs> I, you know you you hope that those people will just stay away. <laughs> just leave you alone. Um, but uh, I wish people would take it from like a perspective of you know this is their story that they're trying to tell. And you get a lot of feedback. You should have done this. Why didn't you put this in your book? Why why did you do this? Well, because it's my story. That's why. This is how I want it to go, you know? And I have a lot of respect for authors who um, don't make too many changes based off of, you know, beta readers and that sort of thing. You know, let it be your story. Um, so anyway. All right, Julie. So what's next for you? What are you working on now? Well... <laughs> I told you that I started with children's historical fiction, and I wrote two before I started writing The Regency, and I really need to go back to that because it's the end of 1942. Well, there's a few more years of the war, and I ended the second book on a little bit of a cliffhanger, mm -hmm. and so I want to finish that. I want to finish the years of the war and make that into a series. And just so the listeners know, these are um, children's books, but they're chapter books. They're, about how long are they? They are about 150 pages. Okay, so probably like fifth grade. It's it's directed at third to about seventh grade. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Um, so that I'm going to have to revisit that and finish out the war with them. Um, because as you know, your characters become your friends. Mm -hmm. It's almost like they're real people. And that makes us sound a bit crazy, but... <laughs> Um, yeah, um, I, I've written another Regency, it, well, it's like five eighths finished, um, but I had to do some editing, so I've put that on hold for a bit, um, and that explores arranged marriages, 
because in the secret of Havisham House, her everyone pretty much is, has an arranged marriage. That is outside what I can comprehend. So I wanted to explore it a bit more. And I had to have a character who would be forced into an arranged marriage. So that's that's the other one I'm working on. And then I thought, what the heck? I'm going to try something else. And I love murder mystery. Like Agatha Christie is who got me to be a reader when I was about 10. I didn't actually like reading before then. And then I picked up one of her books at the library and I read everything that she had. And there's a real revival of that genre. And um, I've read a few and I follow a couple of people and I've joined a Facebook group. So I thought I'm going to write a cozy mystery. Now cozy, I'm not sure quite if mine will fall into that definition because it's not going to be in a small town, but it is definitely Agatha Christie-esque. Mm-hmm. Is it going to be like a period? 1920s. Okay. Yes. So between World War One and World War II, um, and I really am enjoying the character. It's That's going to be a series. Um, the main character will be the sleuth throughout this series of books. And I have finished um, the first one. And I'm just going through the... I do a big edit after I've thrown everything on paper. So I'm almost done with my big edit. And then it will go to my beta readers. And so that is in my future. That's... That's quite the uh, course change, yeah. <laughs> yeah. From Regency. <laughs> yeah. But um, I think if you're a good writer, you could probably write about anything. It's all about uh, imagination, don't you think? I do. And w- I, you may have had this same thing. Before I was a writer, I thought, how on earth do they come up with ideas? Well, once you start writing... Mm-hmm your mind says, ooh, what would happen if we did this instead? Right. But you cannot go in that direction because it's not right for that current book. So you put it on the shelf in your mind and you come back to it. In the um, mystery that I have written, I needed a, a financial crisis. So I didn't know any financial crisis crises in the 1920s, so I looked one up and I found one That is American, and I needed it to be American, even though it's set in England. Um, That would have ruined people financially, Mm -hmm. but it was real. And as I investigated it more, which was kind of over the top for what I needed, but I was just fascinated. I said to my husband, this would write itself. It is a real um, thriller that involved an American president and so that's in the back of my mind too. But I, I think writing two different kinds of books at the same time is probably my limit. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so I put that on the shelf in my mind, but I definitely would like to go back and write that story mm-hmm. because all the facts are already there and I just have to create the fictional part. And I think that would be a good challenge. So you said you're a pantser writer. Yes. So does that mean... I, I'm kind of a hybrid. I do a little bit of both. I do some serious plotting beforehand, but then everything else is a uh, pantser, as you would put it. Um, so do you do you feel your characters? Do you put yourself in their place when you write? How much do you fall into the story when you're writing? Would you say that you become your characters? I don't think so. Or are you watching it more like a movie in your head? I think I'm watching it as a movie Mm -hmm. in my head. That's a really good way of putting it. Do you feel what they feel? I try and do that because otherwise, how is it going to resonate with the reader? So Mm -hmm. I do try and put myself in their shoes, especially with romance. So I'm on my third romance, and I don't want to repeat writing the emotion the way I did in the first two. Well, that's a challenge, right? And so, yeah, I do try and put myself in their shoes so that I'm not just parroting what I put in the other books. And that that is a challenge, don't mm-hmm. you think? To keep it fresh and so that your readers aren't, oh, that's how she wrote it in the other book. So, no, I don't really get into my characters um, in that respect. But what I do find interesting is when I write, characters will appear. 
So in the Regency that I've almost finished is this most amazing character. And I hadn't planned her at all. She was so exciting and so interesting that I was texting my family members. I have met the most amazing person today. She's this eccentric <laughs> old lady whose um, fiance died when she was young. But she, so she stayed in that period of time. You know how some people will keep a room the same for someone that's died? Well, she just keeps her whole life the same. So when my one of my main characters meets her, it's like he stepped back in time because she's dressed like someone from the French Revolution because she can't move on. So she has the powdered wig. She has the rouge on her lips and on her cheeks. And she's just bizarre. And it was just so interesting to meet her. She just came out of my fingers without planning in my head. And she's one of my favorite characters ever. In fact, as I'm going back to edit it, I think I'm going to expand her length in the story because she was a means to an end, but she's too interesting. So I'm going to have to develop her a bit more. <laughs> that's, that's interesting how that happens. That happened to me as well with a character that was just supposed to be in a couple chapters. And uh, they're one of the main characters in the next book. <laughs> so <laughs> they became go. so interesting to me. Yeah. Um, and I just wanted to tell more of their stories. So and going back to your question about do you become the character? Putting a book out for the world to read and for anyone to critique is terrifying. Mm -hmm. And maybe that's why I don't do that, because when they're critiquing it or criticizing my character, it's not me. If it was me, I would think I would take it even more personally. Mm -hmm. So maybe I protect my heart by not doing that because it's not conscious. Yeah, I, I think I, I do put myself, um, I do, while I'm writing, in a way, become my character. And I, th I think the way I've worked around that, you know, the critiquing, is like I was saying before, is just thinking, well, this, this book's not for you. <laughs> And that's, that's why you don't not like it, a bad which is true. Idea, but it's also how I protect my heart <laughs> when it comes to my work. So when I wrote um, British War Children, the first book, there are a handful of characters because you're writing for children. You can't make it too complicated because you want the kids to keep reading because of the story. Mm -hmm. So it's very limited on how many characters there are. Well, then fast forward to writing for adults. That's not an issue, and particularly because this was about a girl's true birth parents, immediately there are a lot more characters. Well, then it became unwieldy because you've got characters coming in here and there. And like I said, I'm a genealogist as well. And I decided to use my skills as a genealogist and I would print off family group sheets, blank ones, and fill them in with the names of my characters so I could keep them straight because... I was like, is that the aunt or the second cousin? <laughs> and then I could have it all laid out and organize who the people were. Not that I had planned everything they were going to do, but it just becomes too many people. Right. And I needed to keep it straight in my head. So that, w that was another thing that I do that helped me with my writing. I, I had the same exact problem. I actually did have adults criticize that I had too many characters. They couldn't keep them straight. Um, but the, what I did was I named almost all of my characters after family members so that I could remember their names because I was having the same problem. <laughs> and then I eventually had to go, I, it got so big, I had to write a grid out of who everybody was and stuff and flip back to it. So you are not alone. That is a common problem, I think. <laughs> yes, yes. When you have so. big stories that expand out beyond just your main characters and their little focus. So you are not alone. <laughs> Julie, thank you so much for chatting with me today. Where can everyone find you on social media? I have an author Facebook page. So just go to Julie Mayton, author. And I have an Instagram for my Regency books. That is just Regency books. I have a Twitter account at Julie Mayton. And I have a website that is juliemayton.com. I also have one for my children's historical fiction called britishwarchildren.com.
Awesome. Okay, so if you'd like a copy of Julie's book, The Secret of Haversham House, you can find it on cedarfort.com, also on amazon.com. And are your books at Siegel Book and Deseret Book as well? Yes. Awesome. And that's The Secret of Haversham House by Julie Maytern, spelled M-A-T-E-R-N. Thanks for visiting with me today, Julie. I really appreciate it. Thanks for the opportunity.